world trying to sing about fintech trust too when i can see that uh, you know i think you guys have actually cherry picked the panelists and uh, you know this looks really nice for me in fact you know to ask some pertinent questions to all the panelists and try to understand the mood of the fintechs right now so in fact we have you know, uh, from intro space to you know fintech space the credit space we have all the people here so let's begin and you know as you know, the need of the panel discussion is it's not a sprint it's a marathon uh, i will come to you asna first and we have seen you know digital developments in the fintech space even during pandemic uh the energy is still there the spirit is still there when we went under a lockdown the challenges and issues were there and initially everyone thought that you know fintechs will have a tough time but actually when you look at the data of the investments you know it shows that the graph is ascending so uh when we are going for a marathon if we take that as a quote from the panel discussion upasta what is it that is required to be in the marathon for fintechs for insurtechs for startups or specifically for mobile So it's an honor to be here. Thanks, thanks for having me here. And um, I think to your question, I mean, I think conceptually uh, in India, when you think about digitization of payments and uh, um, you know financial services, you know, demonetization was one watershed moment. Uh, and I think that uh, I think that. covid um, unfortunately or fortunately while uh, the human toll is uh, massive i think from a long term perspective you know it will have a very positive effect um, on the entire fintech and payment space because more and more people are now um, you know moving uh, uh, to digital payments and to that aspect you know when you said sprint versus marathon I think for every business, uh, you know, whether it is a merchant-facing business, consumer-facing business, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, distribution of insurance or credit or payments, like all my co-panelists, these are all the businesses that we are all involved in. I think having a long-term view of what your company is trying to achieve over the next three years, five years, I think that is what everyone needs to strive for. Momentary blips, three months, six months, I think they can all be lived with. and i can tell you in my 10 year career uh, running mobi quick we've had several such uh, you know blips happening because of the macro or large ecosystem changes but i think if the if the gumption and the courage is there to make something happen from a long term perspective then you know one builds the endurance and finds the right markers and drivers which one can use to get ourselves out of any momentary blips so i do definitely think that building a uh, uh, building a successful business involves uh you being focused on a long term view and not a short term 3 month 6 month or even 12 month view right pasna rashid i will come to you and uh, maybe i will take you know this common question to all of you trying to understand your view on the you know how to how what is that is required for the to be in the marathon Yeah. So look, any startup is a marathon. So that's that's how you start the business. With uh, I don't think uh, it's a get rich quick uh, models, which uh, which people think could be from an outside view. Uh, when as an entrepreneur, when you say that okay, I want to start some uh, business or an active uh, business, and uh, it's primarily about you dive yourself into and commit yourself into a marathon. But this marathon is very unique in the sense that it is a marathon. A series of sprints. Okay, it's divided into sprints. The way I see it, so the, you have a first sprint where you're just trying to get your product up and uh, market fit, get into it. Then the first series series of customers come in. Then there's a sprint out there. Then there's a scaling sprint which comes in. I guess it's a ongoing sprint between of two to three years, uh, and the marathon is I think minimum ten to fifteen years if you're creating a genuinely a disruptive business model. So, in my mind, any entrepreneur who is getting into a business has to commit himself for ten to fifteen years. And I, when I see my fellow panelists, Nishesh and Upasna, they have all been committed for more than ten years. I know for sure uh, they've been at, at the job. And uh, similarly, us, uh, Fairson has been on the job for seven years. And we had our own sprints within this big marathon. Uh, first was the regulatory and product market fit, and now we are at the scaling. I would say. At the stage where we are scaling out uh, the business, so I guess that's how it okay. works. And there are various milestones and various aspects and black swan, white swan moments which come within this 10 to 15 years. In any decade, will come in, right? And as a business, either they take you down or there will be an opportunity for you. Now, 
know, it depends on how you see the business and uh, how you convert those uh, events into your advantage or whatever it is. So I guess to give you an answer, I think that's how I see the whole um, startup or this journey. Uh, that is a series of sprints from Ali Marathon. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Rajat. Ashnir, I would like to have your opening comment as well. And if you could add a more spice into it, because the you know why the topic and why the conversation between sprint and marathon is every startup and fintech wants to do a blast first. You know, and then maybe he wants to go for a race. You know, so so what is your opening comment? Yeah, uh, I think it's it's, uh, it's fair uh, because if you look at uh, uh, all the businesses among here, I think I would be the youngest uh, in terms of vintage. Uh, so we've been only around for a couple of years, uh, and so I I. Would fall in the category of a sprinter rather than a marathoner so far, but it's just because I've only run so far <laughs> as well. Uh, the my general view is if you're running a business at all points of time, there will be people outperform you if you look at the short term. So whether it is raising funds, whether it is achieving milestone, uh, get you know getting um, uh, talent, right? Uh, uh, or getting licenses or uh, getting you know the regulatory payment, you will always at different points of time see people um, you know get ahead of you. Now the whole thing to me is not to start, start running after the guy running past at that point of time, right? But you actually have to pace yourself, right? Because every business different has a natural pace of progression. Um, sometimes it requires you to run really really fast. For certain length, and sometimes it requires you to cool off. Right? So I think um, all of the businesses have to be more uh, inward focused and be very, very cautious at the pace at which they can grow, and not start looking externally on saying, "Here, uh, this guy is raising too much money. Uh, I have a bigger business. I should also raise money, right? Um, uh, or you know, why is this taking this like this? There must be some value. I should also take that like this." So I think if you have that kind of internal discipline. Uh, then it naturally becomes a marathon. Okay, I think very well pointed out, Rashmir. Uh, Yashish, Policy Bazaar has been in the marathon since really long. In fact, you have also become a unicorn, you know, very very recently. So I would like how, to have your opening comment on this, and I'm sure you will have a different perspective. Here. So I think uh, rather than uh, see when uh, when Elio and Kipchoge actually runs the marathon. He runs at a speed of three kilometers, three minutes per kilometer, which most of us cannot do one kilometer also at. So, okay. I think uh, uh, I I wouldn't go into whether it's a marathon or a sprint because both have to be done. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And the winners actually run the marathon like a sprint. It's crazy, but actually they do when you really think about it. But I want to get into it. I think I think the real question is: Is time your friend, or is time your enemy? And that's a very important question. I see. I see that a lot of times. So, uh, as they say, you know, as I get older, I will get stronger. Or, as you get older, you're going to get weaker. And that's a very important part because you know sometimes. And uh, Ashneer, since you are the earliest starter out of them, you know sometimes we think uh, that oh, we've only had one year, and that's an advantage because you can think of anything. But then two years get over, and then four years get over, and then five years get over. And have you every year become stronger? And have you at a, on every year, every passing moment, do you feel better about your business than you did one year ago? I think that's a very important part because I'll, I'll tell you where that becomes important. Sometimes what happens is some founders start and they start with a very crazy story, and they believe things will happen within one year, and then things don't happen in a year. They say, "Look, I've only been around for so long, so I need more chances." And that's fine; you get more chances. But at some point, you know, never get into a situation where the narrative loses you, or you get ahead. The narrative gets ahead of you. It should be very solid, I believe, where you feel confident that tomorrow you will be stronger. So, as you are ten years older, you will feel better than. See, sometimes they say it's easier to raise money when you haven't even started. 
because once you start you got a business it's sometimes you get higher valuations before you are profitable but, oh that's a situation we are in by the way a lot of people tell us oh the moment you get profitable your value will go down because you will be valued on profits no longer on revenues and a profit multiple of you know whatever now my point is that should never come to your mind you should always keep getting stronger with time stronger with uh, peace is not weaker with time and i think that is is where the real story is oh good i think uh, important perspective and important words uh, yashish and uh, uh, let me you know shift some gears let me spin some more questions and try to you know get more insights from all of you uh, so past i will come back to you now and as we mentioned you know Required in the marathon. Let me, you know, pick the question a bit more. And you know, could you tell me, uh, you know, what is that is important to add different layers, partnerships to fintechs or startups, you know, to be more successful, uh, to you know, succeed in the marathon? Because ultimately, we need that energy, we need that bandwidth to cross, you know, the marathon. So, what is that is actually, you know, need to be carried for this fintech? Yeah, so you know, you rightfully said, like you know, Rome was not built in a day, and neither was it built by one human being. So one does need to first build an internal army of people, uh, you know, majors, captains, colonels, if you will, who are willing to follow, uh, you know, the strategy or the direction being set by the founders. So you know, selling starts when with building your team. Uh, so that's number one. And once you have a motivated and capable team behind you. Uh, you know like you rightfully said it is not possible to be especially in the fintech space uh, independent so as an example as a payments company you know we are building these apps where we want to engage users on all their daily life use cases but you know i can tell you i can't do it alone all our partners are all the top banks in the country and you know we partner with them in the back end on all these apis whether it is a uh, money transfer whether it is upi whether it is bill payments Uh, and so yeah of course without creating a, a a model where your team is capable of building large strong partnerships and keeping them live and engaged and active as you move along uh, you know is important i can tell you that whether it is on the payments front whether it is on the uh, lending front uh, so you know we do digital credit uh, on our platform in the last 3 years we have had to partner with various banks and nbfcs in fact uh, rajat's company percent is also a partner for us and uh, kicking off any of these partnerships from day 1 to getting all the pieces in place and then to scaling it these are all like you know two month to six month projects per se and uh, uh, um, uh, definitely create that uh, a differentiation as to at what speed can you develop the product at what speed can you find the partners and then can you build the confidence to scale your partnerships i think we have been fairly uh, well known to be collaborative in the fintech space uh, mobiquick has a very large strategic partnership with bajaj finance uh, on the lending front also now with home credit we actually run co branded apps with both these large nbfcs uh, you know where they users engage with the, the mobiquick app on the payments front Uh, we also partnered uh, during the covid time frame with flipkart where we run the entire bill payment stack on their platform similarly with exico and other companies and of course you know our our payments business would not thrive without the merchant partnerships where you know we have acquired all the large e-commerce as well as uh, you know retail merchants uh, so yeah i mean to your question is partnership uh, a, a key uh, you know skill set Yeah, I think it is an important skill set, and without collaboration and partnership, you know, it is not possible to scale large businesses in the fintech space at all. Okay, I think thank uh, thank you so much, Upasna, for that uh, meaningful loop actually. And Ashnir, I have a very important question to you. Uh, you said you are a one of the biggest company, and you know, uh, also have seen a lot of uh, what you can say a development in payment space already. In fact, the market use payment space specifically, fintechs operating in payment space, has come to a level of saturation. So, considering the current volume, which is really high, we have already crossed two billion, you know, UPI transactions a month. How sustainable it is for you, uh, or the volume that you are seeing right now at RFP? Do you believe it is sustainable for you to have a long run? Yeah. Uh, so if we uh, talk about us at Bharat Pay, we are only on the merchant side of things. Right? Uh, 
so we have very very cautiously stayed away from the consumer side uh, because it's a multi billion bloody back battle out there right uh, not for us to fight very very frankly so what we've chosen is to be on the merchant side and even on the merchant side uh, payments for us is just a door opener right that is what gets us into the shop gets us into the cash flow and what we eventually do as a business is lending to the to the business so if lending is our core business uh, <coughs> and the segment that we operate in is a 500 billion dollar time market out there uh, in terms of <coughs> unsecured lending so uh, i believe at least it on the lending part of our business we just about started right? uh, so we and uh, you know we do 100 125 crore disbursal every month to this segment but the way i look at it is if this can be at least 20x in the next two years that that's how big the, the market segment is now as far as payments is concerned um, even there i think uh, there's a lot of juice still left uh, genuinely there are only 100 million users on upi right uh, so if you consider it a country of 1.3 uh, billion and even half of them should be transactors at some level you only talking about 100 million users so i think whatsapp coming in through whatsapp pay and you know let's give it some time uh, but i think that will take <coughs> upi even deeper so you've got a good headroom on the overall funnel which is payments and on lending you know clearly this you're not competing with anyone genuinely other than good credit and bad credit right um, and if if uh, if you can't build a business giving out money uh, and collecting it back more more importantly then you know <laughs> there's no other business to be built in india very frankly Yeah, right, right. First of all, Rajat, I will, you know, bring you here, and you know, uh, would like you to share some perspective on the lending side. Uh, you know, when P2P licenses were given by RBI, I think few years back, you know, the whole market was really happy that you know, innovation will be there, technology will be there. But I think three, four years down the line, we have not seen a major uptick there. Yes, P2P lenders are making a difference, but I, I don't know whether it has actually grown significantly. Maybe they are going slow. Whatever little regulations were there, uh, so going ahead, what do you see specifically to the lending space? What kind of growth do you see, and whether the model right now do you see it sustainable? Sure, so, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, for last two years, we went silent in terms of PR and all that, and uh, from a point of view of big fundraising announcements, they have not been there in P two P space, right? Uh, having said that, it doesn't mean that the uh, model is not working out, right? Uh, because I know most prism is how much funding has been raised, and uh, that's the sector which is hot, and the other sectors are not working, right? Now, if that is the prism, and I have with all uh, uh, responsibility, I say that uh, is that uh, the way we see the business, we have been growing. We have grown more than 50, 60x. Okay, we are doing more than 125, 130 crores. Of loans every month, okay, uh, with the overall loans of upward of two thousand crores. Okay, that's I'm just one player. I'm not talking about other people. Okay, silently we've been doing the stuff, right? It's uh, I know lending money is easy, and the fact that we have been able to get hundred and fifty thousand lenders on our platform to lend money to these nearly half a million people uh, across India, some fifteen thousand, twelve thousand pin codes, four hundred cities. I do not know which that I I do not know any other company which is a non balance sheet lending platform doing this okay directly or indirectly uh, we don't give any guarantees to anybody uh, whether it's FNGD or anything okay so there is no uh, liability on the book these are new business models we are at that stage when Flipkart was 10 years back or 15 years back actually we are at the stage when we just started e-commerce or so India Times started e-commerce okay. Now to evaluate a platform play uh, uh, from that prism, I would be it's too early because it's two years into. Uh, as Yashish was also saying, it's just two years. Whether how you evaluating yourself, but the way we see it, we are getting stronger every year. We are almost breaking even. Okay, so we have no cash flow issues. Why should I go and raise capital? I do not understand. I am a little uh, as a person, I am old school in terms of raising capital. Uh, I will only tell you when I have, right? Uh, so the scale is there. We are partnering with everybody uh, across the ecosystem. Uh, our thesis around cheap capital has come true, okay. And uh, as we go along, we just opened the institutional lending 
gaming platform also, which is Fairsim Pro, uh, where we've already got around 50, around 60 crores of commitment. Right? We are targeting a 100 crore pool. Now that's the scale and velocity with which the business is working right now. I I don't think there will be another one or two people who would be lending that at that scale. Okay. Uh, so that's the scale at which we could be, and we are. And I'm just talking about one player. There are some 21 players in the market. And uh, most of, I don't think any of them have shut down. But I know a lot of digital lending companies which have shut down during the pandemic. Okay. Right. Out of the 300, uh, at least 60-70% have shut down more or less. Uh, that's what we understand. <clears throat> so I think P2P as a platform play, as a digital lending platform, non-risk model, non-book lending, is the next generation business model across the world. Uh, whether you talk about any of the governments, any of the regulators, they have been coming out with regulations around this. Okay. Uh, there's a euphoria across the, whether it's Indonesia, Malaysia, Japan, Vietnam, every geography has come out with its P2P lending or digital lending regulations. Right. And the whole concept of neo banking and digital banks is built around this kind of models where you can, can you get these people working together, lenders and borrowers. Uh, to transact amongst themselves, right? Now, that's the view which we see the digital lending platforms will evolve into over the period of time. And uh, with, frankly speaking, digital currency is also there, whether you talk about bitcoins and everything. So, there's a new world view which we have, which is in the next 10 years. Uh, we are not saying that the lending will go away, but the new form of lending will start coming in. And this will be driven by non-balance sheet lending platforms. Uh, so that's how we see the whole model. Okay, okay. Noted, Manjad. Uh, Yashish, with your experience, uh, I would like you to tell us the major challenges that the fintechs, insure tech face to how sustainable, you know, what you can say, uh, a run in the marathon. Uh, you are operating in a space where even insurance companies in a full-fledged manner couldn't help penetration grow, couldn't reach out to last minds and you are there you know, since a really long time. So, how did you, you know, face the challenges? How did you resolve them? And, you know, how do you think that the fintech startups and insurtechs can resolve the challenges they face when they are in the marathon race? Oh, I really liked what uh, Rajat said and what Ashneer said. Uh, so I'll, I'll treat them differently because we have both a lending platform and a insurance platform, Pesa Bazaar and Policy Bazaar. Uh, and I'll, I like this idea of non-balance sheet uh, uh, lending. I think uh, Pesa Bazaar also is a non-balance sheet kind of lender. And uh, I think it can do a lot of stuff in peer-to-peer -peer as well with, with Rajat and all you guys. So I think that uh, is clearly an opportunity. Uh, I think on the... And, and both platforms have different challenges. I think in lending, the challenge is always collecting money. That's the biggest uh, challenge. In insurance, there's a two-pronged ch ch challenge. Uh, one is getting customers. Uh, and the second is uh, is uh, getting uh, getting getting your claims ratio right. It's a very difficult one. And you know, today, if I look, for example, in the health insurance, the life insurance industry, the majority has come in the insurance industry where People don't just want volume. People want volume where the claims are also controlled because companies are getting public and you know all those things are all the good, all the right things are happening. And uh, in a country where you know three four percent penetration is there, it's very difficult. So if you really look at, uh, uh, I see the I see the big challenge is getting quality customers. Uh, I'll give you a very simple example, Amul. If you look at health insurance, for example, everybody wants young customers, but young customers don't want health insurance. And yes. the customers who are above 55, on average, have a six times higher cost. They have the highest need for the product, but unfortunately, one of the lowest affordability for the product. Right? So it's a it's a it's a difficult one, right? Because the moment uh, if if Ashneer or Rajat or Upasna or I, any of us four, were to sit on the plane, all of us are at different risk. So I think both lending and insurance are fairly uh, powerful businesses from a data perspective. I think insurance needs to have more data than lending actually, because in lending you only lose what you've lent out. In insurance you could lose thousand times the capital that you have. And 
you have to not just have the ability to do so so and that's that's precisely why they are regulated businesses that's precisely why both of these are heavily regulated businesses so uh, i think the challenges are clear to uh, clearly about customer acquisition i do believe anybody who is solving the data problem in a meaningful manner uh, or the customer service problem in a meaningful manner does have a space here in this industry and uh, you know people will gravitate towards them from a service perspective uh, but uh, but i do believe one has to be very careful when you start to deploy balance sheet uh, both on the lending side or on the insurance side because uh, the claims the claims or the or the or the risk can hit you in the longer term okay i noted noted uh, yes is valid points so uh, upasna you know uh, 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 Ashwin also mentioned. Ashish also mentioned. Uh, you know, most of the startups or fintechs operating in this space, you know, also try to copy each other. And we have seen a lot of examples where you know many fintechs have failed. So, being a new company, uh, obviously, no, because it's not that new. But you know, I'm talking about in general specific fintech companies because you're operating in a new business model altogether. How tough it is to analyze a different path every day because you know you should have a sustainable journey. You should be in the marathon. Ultimately, you should partner more. So, what makes you confident that you are going on the right right path? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking that. I think that's quite a pertinent question because uh, you know early on, Yashi had also mentioned that you know. you are trying to do something different you are trying to build a new model and you know um, albeit all of us are operating in a fair uh, new space especially in the indian market context of the indian market and uh, staying staying on top of uh, global trends staying on top of you know regional let's say south asia trends and how one is uh, sort of building out one business and the business lines within that is of course you know a key uh, key space that is one is thinking about all the time uh, so as an example you know you cannot defocus your companies by going in five directions uh, some companies have done that it doesn't necessarily work out for everyone but at the same time you cannot be so focused and zone in on one area that you don't see you know what is evolving right next to you or in an ancillary business of yours so it, this is sort of one of those conundrums which i think uh, you know many founders struggle with which is to say on a year by year basis or on a six monthly basis one keeps reevaluating that which are the top two areas where one wants to double down on and you know that is of course always keeping in mind with what's happening uh, you know regionally globally another thing i wanted to talk about is that explaining what you do and what you are trying to do and why that is different from let's say um, you know i can just say at any given point in time the payment sector in india has always had severe competition you know from five players to 10 players but within that also there are some people who are completely focused on upi there are some people who are focused more on the merchant side so explaining with a very simple clarity you know what is your thing and what is the thing in which you are going to be number one uh, that is extremely important uh, both from a messaging and positioning point of view and also from the point of view of the market you know especially if one is thinking about either raising money in terms of private capital or getting to the market i think this is one area where uh, you know there is a lot of opportunity for indian founders uh, you know to improve and i can say this from my uh, own journey and the reason for that is because what we are doing right now in india is completely new uh, if you look at uh, europe or america they are operating in a completely different model most of the foreign direct investments are either coming from there or china so to explain to them that this is the macro in india this is the context in india within this these are all the players but they are doing a different thing and i am doing this and my closest competition is this and they are doing this it's a very very uh, interesting challenge and um, you know i think that uh, uh, we all have to struggle with uh, focus versus defocus uh, at our entire journey uh, as founders can't can't do anything about that 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 is a that is a that is a good problem to have so oh, very very interesting that's a good problem uh, very nice uh, upasna arshnil uh, could you tell me you know because what i have also seen and you know is this that 
most of the fintechs, apart from the partnerships, are also trying to venture into different business models. You know, payment companies automatically go into the credit business now. Along with credit, they want to do something else. So, is it that that they don't want to stick to one business, or they should have multiple businesses because they don't know which which one will succeed? If something goes fa- something fails, we should have something else. I think uh, it's also uh, it's also a valuation problem at some at some places, right? Like, you know, if, uh, uh, if you don't look at the valuation, then you can only do one business because you all always know which is the cash cow, right? Like, uh, the I think the problem becomes for the founder when uh, what he's trying to also look at is what the investors want, right? right. And sometimes the investors want uh, very stupid things. Uh, so I think it's it's uh, you know. To me, uh, there's a lot of value in staying focused. And right? uh, I'm, I'm not saying you should not be doing three things or four things, but the moment you start doing 10, 15 things, right, and each of those things has, you know, nothing, you know, uh, comes out as your top priority or the top three things you want to do, then you're in a soup, right? Because you don't know what's going to work, and you're just thrashing and saying, "Yeah, which we chalta hai, theek hai." Uh, so uh, I think a lot of fintech has gone in that direction. Uh, I think simple, like I mean, most people know money is in lending, right? Like I'm, uh, it's very simple, right? It's, it's been written all over the place for years now. Uh, but people still want to somehow make money in payments. Uh, people still think uh, someone will give them some money for VAS. Uh, Indian consumer doesn't pay fifty rupees for. Uh, food delivery. I mean, he is not going to pay you for anything for VAS, right? You know, <laughs> we have very different kind of a market. So I think a lot of the fintechs have to stop looking at what works in the US, what works in the UK. Very different markets. For example, digital digital bank, right? All the Western digital banks work on interchange. Issue cards, have depositors, make interchange. India, this you know, India. So there is no interchange. So what are you going to make money on? How can you fashion yourself on a new, you know, on a new bank in Brazil, right? Model is the, you know. So um, uh, end of the day, for me, focus has more value than trying many things, but it might be different things for different people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ashneer. Uh, Rajat. Uh, A lot of competition for you, for sure, because everybody wants to get into the payment uh, in the in the credit space now. Everybody, in fact, banks are partnering with new age fintechs, and you know they're also trying to see whether you know they can disperse the micro loans or you know something like that. Uh, but when we to be started, you know the biggest target was they will have a tough competition with money lenders. They will kind of abolish the market of money lenders because they actually try to manipulate the customers, uh, specifically the borrowers. So, how do you see? You know the specifically lending space going ahead because you will see a lot of players in the race specifically to you know win that marathon. Yeah, so I, it'll be a little longish answer. I don't know how much time is it, but uh, I, I would like to first uh, remove some misconceptions around the whole model and everything because I don't think people have really understood the model. Maybe it's our fault. I won't blame people for that. Uh, look, P2P and other digital lending platforms model is based on creating alternative supply of capital first. Okay, it's the difference between a Meru and a Ola or Uber. Okay, to put it, I know everybody gives those examples, but they are the most used ones. Now, when Uber started or Ola started, they could have gone and solved Meru's problem of saying that you own certain amount of uh, cars, I can deploy them more efficiently. But it said that everybody has a car. I will make them into taxi drivers. Okay, that's the thesis of the whole problem, right? So the whole P2P lending platforms or digital lending platforms come with the latter thesis. Okay, there is a supply of capital which is locked up with in India with 157 banks. Okay, they are the one only 
solve a consumer problem. Okay, can we get the lenders more bang for their buck, right? Rather than a two percent or four percent or seven percent in the FD, and is a way of to a borrower. Can I reduce this cost of capital by say two to four percent? Okay, now if you believe in this thesis, the business model is there, and that is what every uh, platform or a lending company which is there in this country is attempting to do that. Okay, they all call themselves as platform players and aggregators and non-balance sheet lenders. Uh, with due respect to them, uh, but they are all going to the same same guys who lend money to a bank. Okay, so the best uh, best case scenario is to go and take a credit line from ICIC bank. Okay, and he refuses to give to anybody. Now, this, if you ask a dream uh, credit line for any or any of them, uh, all the fintech lenders is to get a credit line from HDFC bank or ICIC bank. Okay, that's the cheapest capital which is available. The thesis is the same. Can you create a model where you can have your own supply of capital? Okay. Now, having said that, now we are talking about the competition. We do not really generally have a competition on the lending side because we have about 150,000 lenders who are lending money at a certain pace. Uh, on the borrowing side, yes, we have competition with other people, uh, but because we control cheap capital, we are able to onboard a lot of partners. And give them capital to them, right? So that's the model which we are working on. Because we are a digital lending platform, we operate at different level with different product categories. Okay, so we originate a loan at ten percent, uh, that is, and we go up to thirty percent. Okay, right. and these are different types of borrowers which are there on the platform, and different types of partners like Vastas and Mobiko, which is a partner. Okay, they sit as a As a uh, one of the fintech partners with us. Similarly, we have maybe 35, 40 partnerships, originating different types of loans, like an education loan or a <coughs> consumer loan, and those kind of things which we are originating on the platform. And similarly, we have direct borrowers who come on the platform. So the digital lending platforms will evolve into a different. That's why I said there's a whole new ecosystem because the topic is something different. So I'm not spending time on that. Uh, the world, the digital lending and the lending business in next ten years will be a totally a different animal from what we are discussing today. Uh, because the capital which is getting locked and being uh, unlocked uh, from the banks will move away to other platforms. That's how I see the business. And then, in that prism, when you see the competition, it will be a different type of competition, a different type of animal which will be which will be solving for. Okay. Okay. So. so Different animal. Yes, we sure. You know, time in uh, explaining the because yes, yes. But I think you got your point, uh, Rajat. Uh, uh, yes, you know what is more important when you are, you know, uh, playing any sports or taking part anywhere is not whether the audience is cheering you up. Uh, what I would like you to tell us is whether the ecosystem is there to cheer you up. Uh, when I say, you know, you, uh, what I mean is policy bazaar, paisa bazaar. You know, fair cent. You know, mobile pay, Bharat Pay, and all the fintech and venture tech companies. Is there is a right ecosystem right now? Are there like everybody sharing up the digital payment societies and you know the companies right now? I uh, see. Everybody will have their own agendas. I, I, the the answer first is yes. The the government is very supportive. The uh, when when we talk to different ministries, they are very supportive. They want India to have. Digital rails. Clearly, the UPI was brought in. One of the reasons payments is so successful across this country, as well as uh, you know, increasingly many of the players who are getting quite successful, is because UPI existed. And the UPI was created as a as a rails and it opened rails to the entire lending industry and to the payments industry. So I think yes, the government is supportive and wants more and more uh, fintechs to emerge. At the same time, of course, there will be people who. You know, uh, may, may not like it as much. Clearly, you know, as uh, Rajat says, if tomorrow what the banks are doing and earning three, four percent margin on is then being done by Rajat, then you know the banks may have some issue with that, right? And uh, may have, I'm saying. Or you know, if uh, if somebody is taking the credit card business away from the banks, then again the banks may have some issue sometime in the future. So yes, the banks are also going to you know try and defend their turf, and they are also fairly. Very, very strongly connected uh, into you know various uh, places. So clearly, you you will never have a situation where everybody is with you. So uh, uh, there will be partnerships. We are all at the end of it, frenemies, right? I think this was a term that somebody 
explain to me we are friends we like to cooperate at the same time everybody wants that you know they can have a little more of the share than 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 the others that's all okay okay uh, noted yashish obviously uh, partnership friends that is what is happening in the fintech and the entire digital ecosystem uh watch is ticking but i still have like two three minutes and i will start with you only one important questions to all of you uh to start with uh, if we want to succeed in the marathon we want to be in the top 3 4 yashish what is that fintech feature tech startup for the company should have i think what ashni said focus you need to know what you are doing and you need to be focused on that because it'll take every ounce of that focus to succeed in that one thing that you're doing okay noted uh, yashish upasna what do you think what should be there with the fintech insure tech or the company you know to succeed the marathon yeah i think that uh, bias for action strong execution after the vision is set i think that uh, uh, there are some companies that are, that are doing exceptionally well in the last uh, couple of years and even this year and some of my uh, you know co-panelists are from those companies and we are hearing about a lot of indian companies looking at getting to the public markets next year and the year after so i'm very excited i think that setting a strong goal and uh, exemplary execution after setting the goal now all you are muted all of you yeah i'm so sorry for that so just what is there in your so, mind i think it's a bit of a short pass the audio set about the goal and focus and which has been all set uh, in my mind there's one thing which especially startups uh, if you're a traditional business mind you don't need to do that uh, but uh, in a startup what you need to have a world view of uh, what will the world look like or your industry will look like after 5 10 years this in a normal marathon is very clear we know the starting point of the destination in this you do not know where the destination is so firstly you have to believe and build a destination in your mind what it is going to be and then you have to get your people uh, firstly your first set of people the employees and then the customers to walk that uh, with you to that destination right and if you don't have clarity on the that destination or what the world will be after 5 years or 10 years you could be wrong that's fine there's nothing in and you can fail i'm not talking about that you have to succeed or not correct correct so that's the important uh, part of the whole thing that uh, the world view has to be fixed by you and you believe in it and build your business sure because i nationally in your you have the last one uh, you know this kind of covid you but if you could want to add something to it Well, let me first become successful, then I'll maybe what I say will ha- have some credibility as well. What if you use it that you used to say that? <laughs> When you become the successful, okay. No, but I think that is a uh, quite interesting view. In fact, uh, and Yashish being a very experienced one, being a you know what you can say unicorn company now, and in fact, Vikas now also record and added different views to uh, here. I guess it's a uh, interesting thoughts, and you know, thank you so much, uh, you know, Rajat, Yashish, Ashneer, and Vasna for sharing remarkable insights on this panel. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning into Golf Index Festival.